um, it will be around 36 minutes total. You know, I mean, around that time, around 36 to 40 minutes total, which is good because that gives you an extra. So if you want to time yourself for response, and then if you go over 30 seconds, I think that's going to be fine. So we don't have to, um, you know, have somebody tell you, unless Megan would send a message to you privately on chat, like, <laughs> Knock it off. like yeah, yeah, you need to like move, exactly. we're moving on to the next question. Okay. So I hadn't sent, uh, when I sent the bio, which was briefer, uh, I hadn't sent, you know, contact information that came up and that makes a lot of sense, you know. It would be good to put it on, now. it would be good to put it on chat. Um, I'm going to put that in right now so you can either include it right. in the so bio I, or I can repost it sure. when the bio comes up. Yeah, I invite people. So, so now people will be seeing what's on chat. So I invite you all to start putting in your bio and contact information on chat. Yeah. That saves us, that saves us a lot of time. And I'm glad to see you all here. This is going to be a great conversation. I know. Uh, yeah. So many of us live near each other. It's so funny that we're on. So where, where are you from? Where are you, Randy? Um, I am here in the Bay. I live in Alameda. Okay. Just across the Bay. From yeah. Here. And Pam, you're, you're in uh, Canada. Actually, right now I'm in Irvine, California, but I live. Oh, um, and of course you are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I live in Calgary, Alberta. I've been in Canada for almost 20 years now. I'm originally from Texas but I've lived in Canada since 2000. In Sabah? Did so I'm I just first... visiting some family right now. Excuse me? No, I was asking Sabah. Oh, okay. Oh. Also, where you're, where yeah. you are right now. I am in Fremont, California. Okay. Which uh, the way I described it is you're also in San Francisco. For people yeah, we're... not in the Bay Area, which is almost none of us. Almost. Hi, Pam. Uh, Hi. <laughs> I think you're in the so... South Bay. So. Right. So if you look at the at the Bay, San Francisco Bay is a clock. We're about four o'clock or five o'clock. Right. <laughs> okay. At least uh, you're not giving me the hand where Minnesota people always tell me, look at the hand. Have you heard about that? If you're from Minnesota. Okay. Um, anyway, or is that, that Michigan? I think it's Dakota. Minnesota or Michigan. They would tell you, look at the hand where I'm in this part of the hand. Exactly. Um, right. So we're kind of the... I'm I'm an immigrant from the Philippines. I, I moved here in 2003. Um, okay. But I've lived in San Francisco for about 10 years now. And I just became a U.S. citizen last Monday. <laughs> so congratulations. Yay! Welcome home. Yeah, know, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. I, that was a relief. I could vote. That's the most important thing right now. Yeah, we oh, need yeah. it. No, no kidding. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, the stories. Yeah, so in terms of background, and this will come up in the intro, I guess, I, I'm, I'm a Pakistani, uh, but I was born and, and spent the first 14 years of my life in northwestern Nigeria, mm. uh, which, you know, all those Sharia states you hear about, that's exactly where I was. I, they weren't as crazy back then. It was, uh, Nigeria is actually in itself a very ecumenical community. We're to the extent I like to say of people making fun of each other, you know, at festivals, they will be demanding meat from each other and so on. So that was the traditional Nigeria. And then, of course, I lived in Pakistan for 10 years and then both coasts of the United States. So been around a little bit. Yeah. No, I haven't lived anywhere else uh, except the Bay Area <laughs> since. Right. So I think I met Megan in Berkeley. Yeah, uh, in seminary school, years. Like Pacific that. School of Religion, yes. Yeah. I lived there on, for six years on campus. That was uh, fun, wow. fun years. Right, yeah. And are you, are you doing parish work now, Megan? Or are you still doing, you know? I am. I am here at Grace Lutheran. I'm also a chaplain for the San Francisco Police Department, which is yes, not that's, stressful So you're still, doing, you're still doing that right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, providing care for the community members, right. particularly Perfect. in Grace. All right, you ready for me to start us off? Yes. Yeah. All right, ready or not, here we go. Hey, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our town hall today as we have been listening to voices to help us minimize bias in the Lutheran Church. And today we are shifting from listening to the voices of those who live in the margins of the Lutheran Church to listening to interfaith voices who have some best practices or maybe some don't try this 
um, to share with us um, in hopes that we can think about ways that we can improve our individual responses to bias, our communal responses to bias, and maybe the systems of bias that are entrenched in our church-wide system. If you are joining us on our Zoom webinar, you may notice that it's different from other webinars in that although the participants don't have access to video, this allows us to really center in on those who are sharing with us today. It also prevents people who are hoping to intentionally disrupt our conversation. It makes it a little harder for them to be able to do that. Um, if you are, where, wherever you are watching, you are able to provide questions for our panelists using hashtag Lutherans Listen. If you are using the Zoom webinar, the chat box is for you to share all of your wisdom and anything that you want to share with each other. But if you have specific questions for our panelists today, I'd ask that you use the Q&A section. I'll find it wherever you end up sorting it and it'll be fine, um, but it's a little bit easier if you use that Q&A section. Technology is a beautiful thing, but the Holy Spirit is funnier than we are. And so sometimes things might go awry. That's a part of our town hall and a part of the life that we live. Let's give each other grace. Um, I also wanna give people permission at the beginning of our town hall that though you are from communities, that we would love it if you knew the, the will and the mind of everyone in your community. I wanna grant you permission to just speak for yourself as an individual and to do the best you can. Uh, with the information that you are providing today. Uh, with that, I would love to turn over today's panel to Pastor Israel. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Izzy Alvaran um, from uh, San Francisco. I'm a United Methodist clergy person uh, working for LGBTQ rights in the United Methodist Church through Reconciling Ministries Network. And I'm very glad to help facilitate this conversation today. Um, I would first, of course, uh, give a chance to our panelists uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, if you are uh, looking at the chat on Zoom, you'll see their bios. And I think uh, Megan's also posting that uh, on Facebook uh, as we're doing this live stream. So I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce, to share their name, their context, um, some intersections they embody and how these intersections affect um, their faith. So let me, and then they'll be inviting each other after the first person speaks. Let me uh, invite uh, Randy to, uh, Randy Weed to introduce yourself. How did I know I'd be the first one to go? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name's Randy. I use she, her pronouns, and I am here in the Bay Area. I work with Keshet, um, and Keshet is an organization I work for LGBTQ inclusion in Jewish life. Um, I am a lesbian cis female and really proud to be doing this social justice work here in the Bay. Um, a lot of this work that I do is I work with many different organizations, congregations, and uh, Jewish communities on LGBTQ inclusion. And we go in as an organization and support those communities to um, start off with inclusion uh, or build on what they're already doing. Some of our organizations are um, more conservative in the Jewish movement or, uh, <laughs> and, and or reform. Um, and so we meet everyone where they are and what they want to be accomplishing for their uh, communities. And so I always say when that person or that family or that individual walks through those doors, they know that they're welcome in their home. And that's a lot of the work that we do here in the Bay Area, along with nationally and internationally. We actually um, have started in, in Toronto with uh, a big leadership project up there. So my work is centered here in the Bay Area because I am the Bay Area Education and Training Manager, but Keshet is a national organization working for LGBTQ inclusion in Jewish life. So we are all over the place. And I'm gonna pass it to Pam. Thank you so much, Randy, and uh, welcome your organization to Canada, the lovely world of Canada, and to Toronto, which is uh, m my home now. Um, so yeah, my name is Pam Rocker, my pronouns are she, her, and um, 
Yeah, so lovely to be here today. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Megan's work and excited to hear from all of the other folks on this panel as well. So some of the context for me is um, I grew up in a, a pretty traditional conservative evangelical uh, home and context in, in Texas. And, um, you know, at that time, I really felt like God was a Republican. And um, at the age of 13, I subscribed to the Rush Limbaugh newsletter. So that kind of shows you uh, my a little bit of where I started out. And then um, over time, I, I moved to Canada and, um, you know, went, went through this sort of transformational journey, not only changing countries, but also, you know, discovering faith in a new way and discovering um, the liberation that faith can bring instead of, instead of the alienation that I, that I grew up with. And so I've been a part of and working alongside the United Church of Canada for um, a little bit over 10 years now. And a big piece of my work is um, actually kind of similar, Randy, to some of the stuff that you've shared in terms of trying to, um, you know, disrupt the illusion that faith and queerness are separate or that they can even that they can even possibly be separate from each other. And I think in, in our context, sometimes um, Canada gets a, you know, uh, you know that, that somehow we've arrived or that we're extremely progressive. Um, more than any, anyone else. And I think, you know, there's pockets where, where that might be the truth, um, but we have a long way to go too. And so working within the United Church of Canada, as well as with lots of other faith traditions and denominations, it's been really fascinating to see how the work of spirituality and how the work of, you know, I would say, you know, dismantling death dealing theology and, and trying to move forward in a way that brings life um, how that's manifested in terms of queerness and queering our imagination as to what's possible. And, you know, the intersections that I bring to the table are obviously my quarter of a century in evangelical missionary work. And then also, you know, um, having sort of this background as well. So I identify as gay and lesbian and queer and I'm cisgender and Canadian, American, Albertan, Texan, um, all those things. And so I feel like all of those things have sort of, you know, lent to me some wisdom from a lot of different sources and, and hopefully the ability to, to give grace um, to folks who um, are on their journeys as we all are in terms of what faith and inclusion um, can actually look like and feel like. And because I've needed that grace often in the things that I'm learning about as I will, um, for a long, long time. So I'm the director of an organization called Affirming Connections. And we founded this um, about two and a half years ago, basically to be a formal entity um, to help churches and individuals, queer individuals and also churches to navigate this journey of spirituality, which is something that's very tender and, um, and important in different ways to us. And we all have different histories with it. Um, and how do we work together in a sense that brings true belonging to the table that people can partake in whatever spirituality is meaningful for them without any barriers to being fully included. Um, and we've been particularly politically active in the past year or so in banning uh, conversion therapy in Calgary, the city that I live in, as well as in Alberta, the province, and then working uh, alongside many, many others in trying to ban conversion therapy and make it part of the criminal code on a federal level as well. Um, so lots of fun stuff happening uh, in Canada and really happy to be connected to you folks and have this conversation today. So um, I'm gonna give it over to Sabahat. Well, oh, hello everyone. Hello, Shalom Salam. Uh, my name is Sabahat Dutra. Uh, and you can call me Sab, that works too. Uh, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, although I, I love that response from someone on a panel once who said, I really would like it if you just talk to me and call me you. Uh, which, you know, if you're gonna talk behind my back, yeah, he, him, his. So uh, that's me, cis hetero male. I, personally, I'm a writer, a communicator. To use the seminary word, I'm a rhetorician based in San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, personally, I've worked in media and tech, and my day jobs are usually as a tech writer. But more uh, 
in a more re relevant way. I'm a member of the board for the local chapter of an organization called the Muslims for Progressive Values. And I was on the founding board uh, the first year the organization came together back in 2007. Uh, MPV, as we call ourselves, advocates for human rights, social justice, inclusion, both in the United States and around the world. We have an, uh, it's kind of an affiliate program we call uh, the Alliance of uh, Inclusive Muslims, where we have uh, relationships around the world. And uh, we formally describe it. We envision and work towards a future where Islam is the wellspring for dignity, justice, compassion, and love for all humanity and the world itself. A uh, core part of our work is establishing and nurturing vibrant, progressive, and inclusive Muslim communities worldwide. So we have chapters around the US and then affiliates, and I think one or two chapters abroad. Now, coming to uh, where we are, personally, as I said, I'm a writer communicator, and I've worked tech media theologically, getting more to the point. I grew up as a traditional Sunni, which you know is the dominant community within the Muslim, uh, we use the word Ummah, the Muslim uh, community globally. And my personal practice is still Hanafi, which is the school of thought followed in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which if you do the numbers comes to about half of all Muslims on the planet, you know, give or take a few hundred million. Uh, and, I, and when I say traditional, I do mean uh, traditional, you know, traditionally conservative, not the neo purist schools that often are discussed and talked about as conservative nowadays. And, you know, folks might be familiar with some of that breakdown. So I, I like to say I was, you know, personally born a little right of center and I've been drifting left ever since. Uh, and, you know, that is how I landed up on in, at MV, MPV, on the board and so on. Um, and as I was saying in the, you know, talking to panelists before, I, I was born in West Africa. So uh, that again, most of Africa follows a different school of Sunni thought, the Malikis. And so we were, you know, growing up there and that, you know, sort of in terms of intersections, I like to sometimes say that I am, uh, let, me, let me see if I can phrase this right on my uh, Twitter uh, handle, it says, Pakistani American, Californian, Karachiite, Awadhi by culture, Nigerian by birth. So that itself, you know, breaks down a lot of that. And as an organization and personally, we identify ourselves as progressive. And there was, especially after 9-11, the tendency to just, everyone wanted to be known as moderate. And we often, I often would get up and say, no, we're not moderate, we're progressive. You know, female clergy, females leading prayer, women leading prayer is not a moderate position in any faith community, we're not. And so that, you know, takes, uh, takes on a, a dynamic of its own. In terms of reaching out to people, both on our national Facebook group now, which is how a lot of people interact, and locally, you get these people every week or so who will come and say, I'm a convert, I'm a young person, I'm a, you know, someone who's come to faith recently. But my local mosque makes me feel uncomfortable. I get kicked out. I'm, I'm not, you know, either because I'm gay or I'm, I'm, I just, even, you know, very straight like me, straight down the middle in personal practice, people, but who have opinions and a progressive outlook and they will get, you know, pushed out or I'll get a lot of pushback. So we, I feel that's, you know, a big part of, of what you might call our actual ministry is being that space. We've had people come for, you know, breaking the fast in Ramadan. And there was this one couple I remember that was, you know, very traditional standard Silicon Valley folks who are usually pretty, um, I would say conservative. But her point was, I want a congregation where I can sit right next to my husband and celebrate. So that's kind of where we are. And of course, that's, and that's the lighthearted. As a national organization, our president, Ani, is involved, engaged with the UN. She's been helping build uh, curriculums in East Africa for women. We have, we have this uh, program called Imams for She, reaching out to traditional village imams and all who want to take a pledge and focus on specifically the condition of women. So that's often who we are, where we are. And um, I think I'll stop there and we'll have that conversation. Thank you oh, very right. much. 
pass it thank on you. to. Yes, well, thank you very much. I mean, we're, we're going on to the actual uh, uh, crux of our conversation after the, your fantastic introductions and the intersections that you bring, that you embody uh, to this conversation today, which are the stories that we're going to have today or here today will help um, Lutherans in the Northern California, Nevada area to create, a, to create a strategy to help individuals, congregations, and denominations to work together to decrease their bias. Um, and bias, of course, uh, happens in different spheres of our existence. It, it's race, it's sexuality, you know, um, and so many other experiences that we have every day. And some of them are unseen or you know some of them unknown but it happens so but we can divide that main questions of how to decrease bias let's start off with individuals persons it usually starts with personal bias right and some of that we learn um, as we're growing up so what have you seen individuals do uh, that has been helpful to decrease their bias like persons strategies right and what do you wish they would do if you were asked, uh, you know, your opinion, like by someone, like what can you do to help me decrease my bias as, a, as an individual? So let's start off with that. Um, let, me, let me call on um, Pam and then we'll move on from there. Thank you. Pam? Sounds good. Thank you, Izzy. I appreciate it. Um, the first thing that I thought of when, when this, I read this question is, um, you know, that the most important research that we can do is listening to stories and, and um, of people who have different lived experiences than us. And so one of the things that, you know, if I start with myself as an individual and what has really shifted my thinking and my heart in ways that has shifted, you know, me beyond very entrenched belief systems and, and patterns of, of behavior is... Uh, really being open to listening and believing the stories of people who are very different from me. And, you know, I see that in my work all the time as well, where individuals who um, have never met or they, they don't think that they have met a queer person or anybody under the, you know, LGBTQ2SIA plus uh, community. And so I think the, the first thing that I really see that impacts people is, you know, whether they sort of upon accident realize that somebody in their life actually holds one of those identities or they personally seek out either you know authors or other public figures because they're curious about you know a different experience than their own um one of the things that individuals ask me all the time is saying you know i don't want to go to the first gay person i meet and ask them all of my questions about about everything um, because yes, you know, uh, I think some of us get asked to answer for the whole entire community, but as Megan said, uh, we can't really do that, <laughs> um, nor should we try. Um, but it's, you know, these days it's actually the gift that we have of technology is that we can find a lot of queer folks, especially in the work that I do. Um, and it can be really accessible because anonymously we can watch videos, we can, uh, watch uh, stuff on Netflix, we can, you know, buy books um, in different places, and we can be curious in a way that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, make us feel really threatened if our belief system is quite different. And so I think even accessing media and accessing books um, has really changed folks a lot in terms of saying, okay, I don't know a lot about this experience. Um, yes, you can just Google it, but also hearing personal stories. And I think you know, more people than I really thought, and I'm reminded of this all the time, individuals who are in more rural contexts, you know, um, especially if it's not an environment where, where most queer folks feel like they can come out, there can be that illusion that there's nobody who's quote unquote different in their, in their town, right? And we even see that even in congregations and, and in faith gatherings. If, if somebody isn't sort of overtly different, you know, on the outside, we can assume that that maybe we're alone in the in the the feelings that we have, and so I think being able to access media and feel like we're not alone has really changed a lot, both for queer folks and for people who um, are allies or even you know are curious about what that would actually even mean. Um, I think another sort of deep thing in terms of our bias, you know, in my faith tradition is 
um, being willing to uh, understand different interpretations of sacred texts. So I know lots of individuals who grew up and for decades they had, you know, only very binary interpretations of right and wrong, of sin, of holiness, um, and all of those things. And one of the things I say is, you know, has been the most detrimental to uh, my community in most ways is that, you know, heterosexuality is sort of seen as the ultimate holiness, right? And that that's what we should aspire to and, and being cisgender as well. And, you know, so I think individuals who have been open to reading different interpretations of those texts and been willing to be uncomfortable with that, um, I think, you know, if they're ready for that invitation, I think is really, really transformative. And, and that can take a long time. I know for me in my own uh, journey, it took me a long time, even though I deeply wanted to accept myself, um, to actually even being open to a different interpretation because we are taught that there's only one way and it can feel really dangerous and unsafe to think differently. But, but I, I see that work for people. Um, one of the other things, I think the, the last thing that I would want to share at, at this time um, about what helps individuals is admitting that they have bias. <laughs> um, I think for a lot of us, um, we can sort of get into this space, especially if we do consider ourselves more enlightened or liberal or progressive. Um, we may not tend to feel like we still have anything that we need to be aware of or um, anything else to learn. And so I think continually being aware of why am I thinking what I'm thinking? You know, why, why do I have this instinctual reaction to this certain belief system, this certain person, this different idea for me? And I think that is a spiritual practice to me. It's a spiritual practice of checking in with why I believe what I believe and why I do what I do. And how does that impact the kind of faith that I want to have in my life? And so I think just admitting we are always going to be biased in some way. It, it's nothing to, um, to, to try to avoid because we're not perfect. And that's not how that's not re realistic expectations, but just to be aware. Um, and I think that that for me, that's a constant reminder of, you know, the the work that I that I want other people to do for me so that they can you know accept and embrace me and that that's my continued spiritual responsibility to the rest of the world as well and I think lastly what I what I wish people would do um you know I I say often that you know if some people are comfortable all the time some people are uncomfortable all the time and so if you're in a space in your life where you feel pretty comfortable in the spaces that you're in, at your workplace, at you know, the place that you worship, in your, in your own family, um, just remember that that's not the reality for a lot of folks. Um, your comfortability isn't porous and it doesn't, it doesn't sort of connect to everybody around you. And so being aware that, you know, some may call it privilege or comfortability or, or however we wanna name it, um, that's not the same reality for everyone. And so to be really curious about what other people experience in their homes and in their communities, because you may not know unless you ask them those questions, because um, we can't tell anything from looking at the outside. So I think being curious um, is, is actually really revolutionary. So, so that's what I have to, to say for now. Um, I'm curious, Randy, as to your thoughts on this question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was like nodding a lot and agreeing with a lot of the things you were saying and, and, you know, it's mirroring a lot of the work that I do and where I am. Um, I didn't mention this earlier in my introduction, uh, but I, so I work for a Jewish organization, but I was not born Jewish. I was not raised Jewish. Um, I have found my Judaism through my own journey of trying to find where I fit and where my own self could fit. And um, I found that in Judaism with the values and with the ways in which the Jewish community works, it felt right for me. Um, but that being said, if you look, I can't really see it very closely, but on my necklace, I have a hamsa. I've got some, some Catholic uh, saints there. I've got, I've got it all basically because that's kind of who I am and what I do and the work that I do. And so when going into different organizations um, to support them with 
diversity and inclusion and kind of meet them where they are. Um, I find looking at those biases is answering and being that person to support them with those questions they may have because they may have gone to the YouTube video, they may have seen the special on Netflix, but they want to have a conversation about that and giving them the opportunity to ask those uncomfortable questions. And I always say that I'm the professional queer. I'm happy to answer those questions because I'm here to learn with you. We have to meet everyone where they are when it comes to their knowledge of being inclusive, their knowledge of why do you always think that I have a husband when I show up? and getting over those biases because that's kind of what we've always had. And the unique part is when I came out, it was LGB and like the T was kind of there. And now we have such an expansive um, language and identities that we can self-identify as. And with that, the conversations can grow and manifest more. And with that, in our, in our faith and in the work that I do and with Judaism, it's like having those awesome conversations. Like I said, I didn't grow up Jewish. So I'm re kind of learning things that I was somewhat taught when I may have gone to Sunday school or tagged along with my friends to church camp. Um, Cause I was like, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure this out, but learning, you know, different stories of gender identities and context in the Torah. And it's like, I've never heard this in the excitement to learn together and relearn the stories and relearn the pieces of our history and the pieces of where we came from in a new light. And I find the melting pot of the Bay Area is that you can live in a household with all of these different identities and your faith will be, and this is the way it is in my household, our faith is ours. It is always manifesting and always changing, but it's there and it's always needing to be fed um, no matter which religion we have in the household. Um, and I bring a lot of that work into working with the organizations I do around the Bay Area, including non-Jewish organizations. You know, a lot of my work we base um, on our Jewish values and how in which we can ingrain those in our communities. But I also find it really valuable to say, these aren't just Jewish values, these are human values. Respect, peace in the home. We have to have those pieces. My favorite is that, you know, we have the divine spark. The universe created us and we're these amazing individual people and let's continue to celebrate that in all of our congregations and organizations. So when it comes to what do I want people to do is ask those questions, seek out our organizations that are doing all of this work to say, you know, I'm trying and it's great that you're trying to get over these biases and try to be a better organization, a better person, a better congregation. And it's okay to ask those questions, but <laughs> me being the professional queer, I'm happy to answer all those questions and try my best to support you. Um, I may not have all the answers and it's always really hard if there's the token queer somewhere and they have to always answer the question. It's a lot to carry around with you. So I, I would like for this is for people to utilize these organizations that are doing all of this really hard, heavy work to support those people in your community. <sighs> Big deep breath. And um, I will pass it on to Saab, right? Did I get yep. right? <laughs> Thank yep. goodness. So I, I, I would like to actually um, retrace some of the lovely things I heard so far. I, I love the phrase, being curious is revolutionary. Uh, and then, of course, I'll come back to finding my own Judaism. Uh, so, yeah, if, as long as we can have a sense of humor about religion, I think we're okay. Uh, anyway, so I, I, what I've been hearing, and this, you know, matches up with uh, the experiences we've had personally as an organization. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the various ways that we've heard about, and I think I think of that bring people to less bias or being more open are either as we saw in the whole gay marriage evolution of the United States, having someone in your life that is, you know, 
to your knowledge of that community. And we, we often talk about LGBTQ, but there's also race. And there is, and I will come back to this, just being progressive is itself something, I, you know, it, it goes off. So there's having someone here in your life. And I would add a sub uh, category to that, which is having an advocate in your life. And I, I'll come back to examples on this and explain what that means. The other thing is, you know, as Pam said, finding or being faced with or realizing that there are alternative or different readings of your religious text and your and your cultural histories and stories right and then of course knowing that you actually realizing you have a bias uh, so in terms of stories for all of those i mean for having someone in your life that we've all come to know as you know as we say in the u.s the huge difference that you know half a generation made in accepting and then legalizing gay marriage came from people knowing a gay person. And there was a whole uh, campaign to that as well. But I, I would like to focus on an example from my own family, my elder brother, and he's okay with this story. I've told it in public before. Uh, my brother is a very traditional conservative person, very religious. Uh, I wish I was, you know, as religious as he was. But that also brought him, and he's a physician, that also brought him to a position on homosexuality that was couched and structured in the traditional approach in Muslim communities and other conservative communities. And he, you know, he would use the old, uh, you know, even the American Medical Association considered homosexuality as a what is it, what was the word as as a mental uh, dysfunction or whatever? But as his daughter, who is now in her twenties, has grown up and become an advocate. Now she's not gay, transgender. She's a, a pretty standard person personally herself, but she's a radical activist. And her years of knocking up against him, and she is not someone he can dismiss. Even me, his younger brother, he can you know shut me up. We're a traditional family, but with his daughter, he has to listen. And her bringing up the issues of gay marriage, of you know, gay folk being, uh, you know, actually part of society, has I have seen him evolve on both, you know, just accepting gay folk as you know, uh, being you know normative, they're part of society, and also, and he's actually I am happy to report started to move on gay marriage itself. So there's that personal experience of, you know, the question about how, what have you seen individuals do, right? On the other side, um, I would go back and talk about myself. I mean, I grew up in Nigeria, then Pakistan, both very conservative traditional societies in a religious way. And Nigeria, which I talked about earlier of, of uh, the conversation where we are a very ecumenical society. I mean, it's a very mixed society, especially in normal, unless you are you know, certain specific people. But there is still a lot of uh, pushback against homosexuality. It's traditional. Catholics are very traditional Catholic. Muslims are very conservative Muslim and so on, right? And of course, for each of these communities, the, the Anglican church is big because of the Church of Nigeria, the Church of Pakistan. And as I came across, and one as a moment of personal evolution, it was my approach to Salman Rushdie, for example, when he wrote, you know, Satanic Verses. There was a lot of reaction in Pakistan, and you know, one of the biggest reactions was there. <clears throat> but over the decades, and it's, it has taken decades, my own approach to Rushdie has evolved. And my first reaction back when I was a teenager was to write an op-ed that, thankfully, was never published. Uh, because it was, you know, hang them high, just don't make too much noise about it. Uh, but over the years, up to where about two years ago, again, a friend of mine took me or, you know, went, we went to watch Sir Salman speak in San Francisco when he was last here. Some folks might have been there. And just hearing him as a fellow writer talk about his evolution, what he has, where he is now, and realizing that his voice is really necessary in the conversation helped me kind of understand what his utility and his importance to society is. Because I have, again, in my personal evolution, gone from where you know I, I used to think as, as a young person that I follow a certain path religiously, 
because I think it's the right one and it has to be the right one. And of course, the, the flip side of that is if I believed another path was better than this, I would switch. You know, I <laughs> have no problem. But that has been an evolution from going to this is the right path to now coming to where my take on, you know, like you said, the divine spark and the bigger picture is that there are different paths to finding that one true uh, you know, truth, reality, hub, whatever you want to call it, right? And I, you know, I found the path that works for me, which I think is, you know, the best way to get there. And that's why I follow it. Frankly, if I got convinced that even within my faith, a different sect had a better way or a way that connected with me better, I would switch. I mean, I would follow them. And they're, and also each of these sects and ways of thinking are so, you know, codified that often it's, you end up picking up something from a from a neighboring sect, you know, religion-wise, sect-wise, even. And in, in personal approaches, I mean, my evolution, like I said, on being a progressive has been an evolution, right? And like I said, I was born slightly right of center, started drifting. <laughs> and the first time I, when I came to grad school in the US, two things happened in grad school. One was in seminars and workshops. I mean, I, I took this course on cultural analysis. Specifically, because I came from a very technical background. I was studying technical writing. I made sure to take a course in cultural analysis. And I found that when we were doing our essays and discussing each other's work, I realized that my thinking or basically my role in, or to put it simply, the writing from LGBTQ uh, you know, classmates and colleagues resonated with me a lot. Even though at that point, I I'd actually never had a personal friend that was out gay. But because they were in class, and then when I started reading or hearing their experience as an outsider in society and, you know, that whole evolution, it just resonated with me. The, the, the mechanics of it resonated with me, not irrespective of who was doing that talking. So that helped me start to evolve. And at one point, back then, we used to have these email flame wars, right? In the middle of it, a friend of mine described me as, and in defending me, he described me as a liberal. He's like, oh, Samad's just so liberal, he's, you know, he's gonna say things like this. And he was saying it as in a non-judgmental way of trying to help other people understand where I was coming from. And I'm like, I'm a liberal? Really? Oh, okay, <laughs> maybe I am. Because it fit, you know, the shoe fits. And then, you know, I lived on the East Coast, moved to the US, and I found myself working in you know peace groups, India Pakistan peace groups, and died in that wool, met a lot of progressive Indians and progressive Pakistanis. And I found myself on a panel like this, you know, back then we didn't have Zoom, it was in at the CIIS in San Francisco. I found myself on a panel describing myself as being and representing a progressive South Asian organization. And I'm like, wait, I'm now, I guess now I'm a progressive. So there was that evolution and literally after that and this would have been 2004 or 5 or something i literally went out and googled the phrase progressive muslim because i realized i you know okay i'm a muslim i'm a progressive i need to find other people of, of and you will be surprised how many times we get new members or mem or uh, you know people curious about our organization that have a very similar story where they kind of at some point realized, okay, I'm progressive. I still believe in my faith. I'm a Muslim. Let me go find other people like me. And they head to Google. And I guess at that point, it might actually have been Yahoo, not even Google. Uh, and sure enough, I found this organization and the movement was starting out that calls itself at that point, the Progressive Muslim Union. And so I joined their email list and I got involved with the organization. That organization kind of flamed out and out of that came our current configuration, which is the Muslim Progressive Values. And I'm like, hey, I'm here. Then we ended up at the you know founding convention. I ended up helping out with the board and then fell back out and then the chapter in San Francisco. So that kind of evolution and I guess those, uh, what you call, uh, those types of evolution, I, I think happen. And just to complete that thought, I said, you know, finding my own Judaism. And again, you grow up in very traditional, you know, Muslim communities, Muslim majority communities. There are very few Jews left 
to begin with, even though if you are paying attention in Sunday school, you are aware at the back of your head of the you know, overlap and the Semitic monotheism that is at the root of all of the faiths. So you, you have that idea of having a lot in common, but they are the enemy. <laughs> and so, but of course, being progressive, moving to the West, I've evolved in all of that. And at one point, I kind of realized that, you know, a lot of these, especially what you might say, high caste Muslims claim descent from the prophet circle. And <laughs> I was sitting there going, so my father's family, claims descent from Ayub Ansari, who was Abu Ayub Ansari, who's buried in Turkey now, and he's part of that community. I was reading a bio and I realized, wait a minute, if he converted from this tribe of that tribe, most probably means he was Jewish. So, and I mean, I joke around that with my niece, that if you're going to get into public life in the US, you've got to make peace with your Jewish roots. Uh, and uh, now I know my estimate and I throw it out, my son makes fun of me, he's like, so yeah, someone says, are you Jewish? I'm like, not for the last 45 generations. Uh, and he's like, my son goes there smiling and he's about 14. He's like, I love the fact that you've worked out the exact number of generations, <laughs> but that's it. You know, like, you know, we've been, we were Jewish 45 generations ago. Uh, so that kind of knowing someone, knowing an advocate in your life, coming to uh, things from facing alternative interpretations of religious texts. We had a wonderful, a uh, sermon this last Eid uh, a few weeks ago where we had a scholar, a female scholar talk about Hagar, uh, who we call Bibi Hajra, right? And her experience with uh, Ishmael and, you know, her life is, is kind of the core of that festival. It's not discussed often because the festival is now structured around Abraham and his uh, sacrificing of his son or attempted sacrifice of his son. No one talks about the fact that it was the mother of that son or Ishmael's mother that is at the core of our rituals for that festival. So that just that, and I've, I've seen one or two people, you know, when they heard about the, that sermon, even my niece, as I said, was a radical progressive. She, she kind of did a double take. She's like, that's right. And that's an interesting way to look at that whole ritual. And which doesn't even change any of the normative interpretations of it. Just the fact that you have to, for the first time, someone points out, hey, this thing has this as its core. Think about it. Right. So that and, and then whether it's being gay or being Jewish, it's also that thing about, hey, they're human. If, if, just look at this whole thing. I mean, they're. Like with my brother, who's a physician, my challenge, my challenge to him was, if you are saying that gay folks have, you know, they're non-normative or they're ill or there's something wrong with them, then your reaction as a person of faith, as a physician, should be compassion, not anger or punishment. Where's your compassion in this? Even if you are saying that they are, uh, you know, and this is not me saying that it is, it's not me agreeing with him, but challenging his own logic from within in, in the Thank sense you. of, you know, where, where is compassion? Where's your compassion? You. So anyway, I think I'll stop there. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to, thank you so much everybody for, for that. Um, a lot of, a lot of input from you, but I, 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 what I picked up there is like the importance of relationships and stories. Um, uh, will help us move forward as individuals. Now let's think of of how bias forms in, in relation to, or how we decrease bias in relation to our congregations and our faith communities in general. So congregations specifically, if you have experience about how how that happens to congregations um, or uh, I think in the Muslim tradition, in like in mosques, you know, or uh, if you if you're in a faith community, whether you want to call it a congregation, a church, a mosque, um, how do you decrease that in an individual congregation, and how does that, how how can that be seen across movements of of faith communities, like denominations, whole denominations, or religions, uh, probably in general, and how do we decrease that? Um, so let's start off uh, with Randy. Thank you. Um, 
The first thing that comes to my mind when working with congregations and working with different individuals or communities is asking the question of when did you ever feel othered? When was a time that you felt othered? And giving that person the context of feeling othered and saying, how did that feel? Like, let's bring it down to what, what does that feel like? And from there, that's where we can start the work of making sure when someone uh, or an individual, a family, whomever walks through those doors, they're not afraid that they have to explain their pronouns. They're not afraid that they have to explain their family dynamic. They have filling out paperwork or filling out an, um, any type of registration form that they don't have to pick the other box for their gender identity or their family dynamic. There's not always a mom and a dad and a family. There's not always male and female for someone's gender identity. And so being aware of those things and <clears throat> being able to say, yeah, we need to bend a little. We're not going to break, we're going to bend. And we're going to do this hard work and say, we may have messed up before, but here's what we can do to continue the work. And I always say that, you know, there's no stamp of approval. There's no end to this work because we have to consistently adapt and grow with our communities and bring that forth to our communities and putting in that work, asking those questions and making sure when someone joins the community that the culture is there for everyone. And it's not just, oh, well, we did that two years ago, but it wasn't really popular. So we're just going to drop that or, oh, it's June. Let's put up one of those like rainbow flag things because it's June, right? They have that big party versus this is who we are. This is who we represent. And no matter which intersection of your identity walks through those doors, you are going to be welcomed. And if you don't feel welcomed, here's how we can support you to fix it because you're obviously walking through those doors or coming into that community for a reason and for you to just leave the community because it's so hurtful, there needs to be work to be done. Um, so I would say for me is just asking those questions and, and where people are willing to bend and finding out how we can continue to grow together. Um, that's what I would say for, for congregations. And it's a lot of the work, I, I do a lot of this work um, around the Bay Area and my colleagues do it nationally because these are always things that need to happen. Um, and what Pam had said earlier is having that intersection of being, whether it's queer and Jewish, some people don't feel that they can be both of those things together. And that should never be a question that should be celebrated for all of your identities that you're bringing into the room because that's what makes up our, our unique melting pot of a community because not everyone is the same, you know, mold, I guess. And I will, I'll let anybody else jump in on that one. Pam? Yeah, oh man, I am really appreciating what the other panelists are sharing. I feel a lot of commonality, but also learning a lot from, from how you articulate the work that you do in your own journey. Um, some of the things that I've seen that, that um, have really worked for congregations in my experience is, um, you know, first of all, I remember um, Dr. Eric Carter is a, is a professor um, of uh, special education at Vanderbilt University. And I remember he did a presentation once on, um, you know, people in the disability community being included or not in church in some way. And he said a really common um, sentiment that he heard from churches often was, you know, we, we'd be happy to welcome somebody who is in a wheelchair or, you know, has other accessibility needs, but no one has come to us and asked us to do that yet. And it's this whole idea that somehow people, you know, have to come to us and ask for something that is just a, an ordinary thing that should exist um, in order for them to feel welcome and to actually belong. And I think that in lots of areas, you know, religious communities can be guilty of this in terms of saying, you know, well, we don't have any queer people here yet, 
but if somebody comes, we can try to figure it out, <laughs> you know, or, you know, we don't have certain rites and rituals for, for these certain ceremonies, but if somebody asks us or brings us a bunch of ideas, then we're open to it. So then, you know, we're automatically creating these barriers to inclusion. And we're asking the very people who are impacted the most by these barriers to fix it for us or to ask to even be included. And so that has really stuck with me, this, this, this idea. And it's also, you know, I think often congregations who don't assume that queer folks don't want to participate. You know, often I hear, you know, well, you know, queer people have been really hurt by the church. And so I don't think they want to be a part of our church anyway. Like somehow, you know, number one, like somehow we know the identities of everybody who's in our church already, which we don't. And often if they don't feel safe, they're not gonna tell us anyway. Um, and that somehow just because people, you know, some people have been harmed by the institution that they, that they don't have a spiritual yearning to belong or that they don't wanna work out their spirituality in a community some, in some way, you know? Um, so I think congregations who have done really well in this process have, have said, okay, it is actually our responsibility whether anybody with any identity ever comes through these doors it's our responsibility and it is a faithful responsibility to do our best to make sure that um, whoever wants to come in here can find meaning and they don't have to question and wonder and worry before they come that it's really explicit um, that they're going to be welcome. And, you know, um, I think uh, I think Randy, maybe you said this, or, or one of you said, you know, that it's just a part of your DNA that that you that you take this on as your identity as an organization to say that this is something that's going to be who we are that has to be nurtured and cared for. It's not a destination. Um, it truly isn't. And when I look at you know how the queer community has ha had to evolve and adapt um, in very short periods of time, just for our own survival, but also to make sure that we include other folks who you know didn't have a letter in our rainbow umbrella before or you know we didn't give space or time to before right you talked about the lgb and now we've you know these other letters are included it's not that they didn't exist before now they didn't have space to flourish they didn't have um the opportunity and the safety in order to do those things and, and still so many people don't right so I think to recognize that our work is simply to allow space for people to name their own truth and understand that none of us are inventing anything new. Um, we are just coming into ourselves and for churches to sort of claim that. I also think approaching it from a holistic perspective. So it's not just about human rights. It's not just about theology and that shift. It's not just about social inclusion. You know, it's not just about different families. It's about all of those things. And so, you know, um, you know, not just, you know, putting up a flag in June, but also, are you able to give a compelling invitation to people in your faith community to say, you know, we understand that we can only start from where we are, but you can bring your questions to the table. You can say, what about these seven texts that, that I'm told in the Bible, you know, condemn uh, homosexuality? Like, what about those things? And, and to really um, help everybody, because everyone in your congregation you know, no matter what, is going to be at different levels. You know, they may look like everyone agrees and everyone's having a great time or whatever, but they're going to have very different perspectives and experiences. And so to offer what you may even think is a basic, you know, um, opportunity and, and that that's okay. You know, 10 years ago, I had never, when I first came out, I had never heard of Stonewall in my entire life. I had no idea what it meant. And so I needed people to sort of help me understand my own history. Um, and others need that, especially if they don't carry that identity. Sometimes it's hard to access this information or we don't know where to start. Um, and um, I also think partnering with local organizations so that you don't have to do this alone. So I've had churches partner with feminist theater companies to present a play to have a conversation about it with queer theater companies, you know, show a film, you know, by um, a, a local director and bring them in for a conversation, you know, try to be creative because activism and inclusion doesn't have to be a drag. It can actually be really fun. And so, you know, making it something that feels robust and that feels exciting to be a part of and accessible for anybody 
no matter where they're at. And, you know, the, the last thing that I'll share, I know we're sort of nearing uh, the, the Q&A time, but the last thing I'll share is one thing that I'm really um, proud of in terms of the denomination, the United Church of Canada, is that, you know, they've been willing to speak out politically. They've been willing to talk about social justice in ways that I think um, have, have been, you know, risky and have alienated some people from our own quote unquote brand, but also have been, have been willing to speak out in ways that do take up some space. And I would call that public theology. I would call that, you know, living our faith in the public square. And I think being willing as a faith community to say, this is not just about what's happening in here, because who, who, whoever comes in to us, yes, those folks matter. But, but what sort of difference are we making in the world? And, and somebody who's never gonna meet us, what, what, do they, what do they know about what we think? And making that a really, you know, I use the acronym PIE, P-I-E, how are we being public? How are we being intentional? And how are we being explicit in what we believe and who we include? And uh, Saab, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. You're I on think mute, you're still Sam. muted. You're muted. I'm sorry. They, you know, that thing where you say sorry before you unmute. Uh, so both, both of the previous speakers have covered a lot of, of, of really rich and deep ground on this. I guess I'll, I'll take it to the other side where we can talk about specific examples, right? In terms of congregations, one thing I, and I, I think it kind of came up with the other folks, is that the history of your own, and we're more of an organization than a congregation, of how you got to where you got and how you organized might not include having to deal with certain issues, right? Like, to be very frank, the, the issue of race, which has been so important in the last few months, is something we haven't dealt with as much as an organization, not because you know, individually or as an organization, we're not sensitive to it or we're not on the right side of the discussion, but because it hasn't come up. We've been, like I said earlier, a space for people who don't fit in any of the usual congregations and we have that progressive side to it. But because of that, we've been gathering or our, you know, caravan, so to speak, to use that word from Rumi or Abul Said, has been about, you know, people that are either gay or multi, within multi-faith, um, uh, multi-faith couples and families, so to speak, and coming from different backgrounds, we hadn't dealt with race as much. But now that the BLM uh, movement came to the fore and the George Floyd situation, it gave us the opportunity and, and made us start to engage with that more. I'm really proud of the way we've done it. And I would actually say that I like the, and I've said this within the organization as well, I like the fact that while a lot of our chapters have been engaging with the public events, you know, protests and all of that, I think the even more important work we've done is internally, getting our leadership together to talk about it, to see how we can better engage with the issue, how we can be more affirmative and work with, and basically engender diversity within our organization and with our uh, who we partner with. So that, that, you know, that's an example of something that isn't, you know, the cause isn't negative or it's not coming from a bad place, but it's just our history. So a moment, you know, to answer the part of the question that says, what have you seen congregations do is, you know, leveraging a moment that comes up and faces us and then engaging with the issue there. And that, you know, to me, uh, that was actually, and the, Sorry, the fact that we're doing it internally and it is making us change our processes internally, to me, the way I look at it, it's actually a longer term effect than just turning up at some, pro and I'm not decrying that work, but that's a different part of it to turn up at protests and be seen to support the issue and speak up publicly, as you said, being public, being intentional, being, what was the last one? Uh, <laughs> explicit. explicit, explicit, right. Explicit, so yeah. being public, intentional, and explicit, but also being internally using that moment to leverage an improvement and, you know, to use the, the, the phrase up our game internally. I, I think that makes a longer term difference to our commitment to that issue than it would just, you know, engaging with it without looking inward and upping our game internally. That, that I, I would say is, and I, I'm kind of proud of our organization for having done more of that. 
I love this because uh, the, the first question that we have, um, we've already got an acronym for and like a whole like five step plan of how we can like resolve this. So like you guys are ahead of the game. I'm so excited to have the, the A team here. Um, I'm gonna, our, the question that was, that, that kind of came up within the, the Zoom Q&A is what do we do to address religious traditions and liturgies that are not inclusive? I'm gonna reframe it just slightly because I know that you all are people who can lift up best practices and you've kind of addressed this a little bit in your previous answers. Um, so what I'm curious about is what are liturgies or sacred texts within your community that you think help shepherd a growth mindset for folk. So maybe um, if, if you were allowed to trade liturgies with people, folk who had um, liturgies that exclude people, are there examples of liturgies that you're like, this is wonderful, or language within your community that you feel like is, is helpful, or rituals that are helpful? Um, and then bonus points if you have sacred texts that go along with that. And I'm going to start with you, um, Pastor Izzy, because you haven't really got to talk much, but you have all of this wisdom in your brain. Well, if I was going to trade uh, something from uh, like another religious tradition, I, I really like the, uh, I might make a mistake, the lighting of the candles for the Jewish community. I remember uh, leading a, a, a protest action that was more liturgy led for um, for worker justice in San Francisco it was also around Christmas time for Christians and you know Christians also like to see lights around Christmas but we had you know we had really big torches um, it was like the lighting of the torches so the uh, and we paraded around downtown San Francisco with those torches like bringing a light to the world so if anything, that would be mm. one liturgy that I would have. And also in, in, in the Methodist tradition, we, and probably all others would have some sort of a social creed. And we do have a, a social creed that has been turned into responsive readings, sung responses, so that people keep on remembering that the same way that they would remember, you know, uh, the prayer that Jesus taught Christians. Uh, that's being used, so... And I'll end there. I, I think I want to hear more from, from, from others. But yes, thank you for giving me a chance to speak a little bit. Well played, moderator. Do you want yes, to invite someone to <laughs> oh, answer yeah. next? Well, I'd be interested in what Sab would say about uh, what you'd want to swap around liturgy or what liturgy you see or rituals would be important. Right. So we, um, like I said, the MPV itself is an organization, but we have a close partnership with the Unity Mosque out of Toronto. And they already have, a, you know, they have a network of mosques around the U.S. They do online uh, prayers and, and Friday prayers and all as well. And I really like that format of uh, they start their meetings with a Native American benediction. And then so they're very inclusive. And uh, and I, I think that's also true. Like the three things I talked about in introducing our organization is, you know, social justice, inclusion and um, compassion. So just that, to me, it's often a reminder of the compassion within our religious communities. And in terms of what you know, we can offer, I mean, you know, we gave you all Rumi, didn't we? Uh, so <laughs> there is, and, and to me, actually, that is something you will hear a lot of very conservative or traditional conservative or, excuse my expression, hard-ass, uh, folks, they will come back and say a lot about the, you know, we have the, all have that, you know, foundational myth in our head of being a compassionate faith, of being an open faith, of, of the, our elders and historical figures who have been very, you know, compassionate, inclusive, nice to other people, you know, stood up for justice. And just that reminder is, is often what is needed. And you can quote from very traditional texts on that, right? So you quote the prophet, you quote, you know, one thing I, I often say is people, when they talk about jihad and, and you know, violent, the violent, milit the militant stuff that has happened over the last 30, 40, 50 years or more is we, why are we not quoting straight up the rules of war as laid out by the prophet and the first four caliphs? 
And you know, my point is, why has no one done that on C-SPAN? Because the moment you get into that, you are countering almost everything the fanatics and the terrorists have done, you know, one by one. They have broken every principle laid out. So that kind of, you know, both the, and that's on the militant side, while we talk on the spiritual side, we all like to own our Sufi uh, elders and our traditional spiritual lineages. So why not quote them, quote them straight up, put, them in, put it in their face and, you know, watch them squirm or not squirm if you want to do it in a more compassionate way. The word compassion is the other thing that comes up, right? We are like I was talking about earlier, you know, uh, make them face the fact that you claim to be a compassionate faith and a, and a spiritual faith and you hold up Rumi and all the others and there's a whole meme going around the internet now about how, you know, Islam has been taken out of Rumi's work. But to which my pushback was, wait a minute, that's, you're getting it backwards. The reason the Sufi poets wrote in these metaphors was to bring the message to people who might not otherwise listen to it. And therefore, we should be encouraging people listening or coming to the message of compassion and peace and all of that via Rumi. And my point is, let's go to the other elders as well. I mean, Rumi is very much only the tip of the iceberg, right? And they are now, even today, especially in South Asia, we have poets that write in that genre, that write in that language. Why are we not quoting them? Why are we not, you know, because people know Rumi, but for us in our, you know, Qawwali and other Sufi music, we talk about Rumi and Hafiz and Asad, uh, um, yeah, Hafiz al Shirazi and Abu Sayyid Abul Khair. I mean, it, it, <laughs> the most commonly quoted uh, piece from quote unquote Rumi is that piece about, you know, ours is not a caravan of despair, which I, I consider sort of a mission statement for myself and our organization. But the funny thing is, it's not actually Rumi. It's a whole other poet who is seen as a very traditional, uh, or at least some form of it is in his work, Abu, uh, Abu Sayyid Abul Khair, who, if you've heard of him, you would think of him as a very traditional, very mainline, very, you know, uh, standard uh, religious scholar, right? But he is who has given not just us as Muslims, but the wider world, that whole idea of being open to, you know, if you're a sinner, you know, we're all familiar with that piece. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, 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 whoever you are. That is coming from very traditional texts. So why don't we, you know, we call out the compassion, we call out the Sufis. And, and like I was saying earlier also about using very things that are embedded in the tradition and the canon, but which are not taken out. You know, my, my favorite moments are even for myself where I'm looking at something and realizing, yes, I've known this all my life, but I've never looked at it and given this aspect of the story the priority that it that it can provide us. So that's kind of my take on that. Thank you, that's great. Randy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, one of the things that, and Saab, you were just, you were, this was kind of resonating with me is, is the taking the traditional text, but also um, having those stories. So one of the things that I found so interesting is that Jews say, we don't have history, we have memories and sharing those memories. And I've had experiences with my partner um, in church at Easter or at Christmas, and we, I'm listening to the text and I like, I get all excited. I'm like, ooh, 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 I know this. M make sure I tell you this story when we get home. And from there, we're talking about stories in the Bible, and then we're talking about stories in the Torah and my interpretation and my storytelling and then their interpretation of the text i think it's it's very it's rich and exciting um i always bring it back to when i was in college i was a theater major and we had to dissect shakespeare right and so i had to look at two lines of shakespeare and really understand the language at that time and what shakespeare was writing and what was the point and i find in text study whether it's torah study or bible study really looking at those texts and understanding when they were written why they were written who they were written by and ways in which we can interpret those then now and in the future and every time we read them they're new to us 
Um, so I find the storytelling pieces of m most religions um, or all religions can be really rich. And I love to kind of intertwine those um, from, you know, different rituals around holidays to different rituals, or rituals around um, the calendar, et cetera, and bringing those kind of full circle and having the excitement around them. I get really excited with, oh, I never heard that, or I've never read the text that way. And one of the things that I've been reading lately on, and I'm happy to like divulge and like jump into this with everybody, is the origin of love. And if you've ever heard the song from Hedwig and also like the creation story with like Adam and Eve and they were a them, et cetera, super exciting and really enjoying the language and the storytelling pieces of it, so. That's really great, thank you. Uh, Pam, we heard a little bit about how the United uh, Muslim community has been having some um, opening rituals that involve the Native American community. Would you be willing to share with folk a little bit about some of the reparations work that has happened in Canada with Native communities? Because it's inspiring to me. Absolutely. And, and what I was going to say in terms of uh, liturgies that I would want to borrow from are from Indigenous peoples. I think, um, especially living in Canada and being in the United Church in general, um, has I've been fortunate enough to be around more Indigenous spiritual practitioners and to learn more about that embodiment um, in the ways that myself as somebody who's not often to, you know, thinking about connecting with the land or connecting with my own body, um, connecting with the environment, you know, to, to bring those rituals of the senses and of connection to um, things outside of just humans, but other, all living things um, has been really, really interesting. Um, sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes really unfamiliar, but really good for my um, I would say more like restrictive sense of, of that faith is just more cerebral and moving it out and inviting it out from there. Um, so I think those traditions and even, you know, things as simple as a land acknowledgement, things, you know, like doing a smudge at, at the beginning of um, any sort of event, right? Recognizing that we're all bodies in the same place, recognizing this land came from somewhere, you know, it, it matters, you know, where we're positioned, where we're standing, um, how it became to be that place, what, what different names that it's been over, over time. Um, and just, I would also say the intergenerational elements of it too, you know, including elders in a meaningful way. And, um, you know, there's also two spirit folks and like what that means to embody different ways of gender and different things that that I think often we think are, are, are new, that people are just, like I said, we're inventing these things, but have, have existed for a long time and all the different ways that colonization has impacted um, indigenous communities, not only in Canada, but around the world. I know for us um, in, in the United Church, um, we have had to do a lot of work um, around um, you know, reconciliation and even just conciliation start with, with the um, indigenous uh, population. The United Church has the shadows in their history in terms of, you know, some of them being supporters and even hosts of residential schools where um, indigenous children, you know, were sent to basically be educated and to act and, and be white and taken from their families. And so, you know, there's been a lot in the past, you know, 30 years um, of a journey of what, what does an apology look like? What does reconciliation look like? Um, you know, how do we do this as a faith community in a way that um, is not just expecting forgiveness and to move on, but what is this, what does this process mean? And, and why did collective we um, ever feel like um, it was uh, that we were allowed to do that, that, that somehow our perspective um, as Christians was the epitome of spirituality and that, you know, that's the, that's the missionary mentality, right? That our way is the only way and, and we must save you. We are compelled to, and actually that, you know, we must discriminate against your practice because this is, this is the right thing to do. Right. 
and so I think not only examining specific situations that we've been involved in historically, but also where does that idea of, um, you know, Christian supremacy and Christian nationalism, you know, how can we dismantle that in the ways that we, that we work alongside others? So, you know, for example, we, we've done a lot of work. We have a lot of indigenous um, uh, people who, you know, are helping us through this journey and, 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 you know, not, no longer simply, you know, asking for help, but providing funding for indigenous folks to be in leadership and to and to lead this the sorts of things. Just as, you know, I don't want to just be asked to, you know, consult on what a queer person or the queer community needs. You know, I want to be able to have a voice at the table and, you know, to be able to share my experience. And so to continue to move to, you know, often it comes down to um, you know, your budget as a reflection of your values. And so, you know, how is the United Church of Canada, as well as individual faith communities, how are we investing in this, um, in this verb of reconciliation? And so um, there's been, you know, for a formal apology, which um, was issued in uh, the 90s that hasn't been accepted by the Indigenous community so far, which actually isn't even really the point, right? The point is the conversation. And um, we've had a lot of formal, um, you know, rituals around listening to stories of, of folks from residential schools and of being aware of the generational trauma that was caused from those things. And, and I think being open to looking at our past and, you know, not looking at it with a sense of guilt, you know, or sense of shame, which gets us nowhere, but with a sense of, we hold this responsibility, I hold this responsibility as a white Christian um, to, to recognize what history has meant and how it impacts the people who, um, you know, this isn't just something that happened before, um, we're dealing with the impacts of it right now. So I think that, you know, that whole piece of connection and of apology is, uh, you know, I would say even just because the last 10 years feels really new for me still, and I feel has invited me into a deeper sense of, of what it means to confess, what it means to um, make things right or to be on that path, and also what it means to not only look at a group of people as quote unquote victims of something happening, but as um, tremendous contributors to, to society as a whole and to to reframe what we've told about those people just as i want people to reframe me not as them over there in terms of you know sort of faceless people but um you know being able to offer everybody a sense of belonging so that's a that's an ongoing process and and i'm thankful for the ways that lots of folks in the united church of canada have been open to doing this in a public way and not trying to sort of hide behind the scenes and um, you know, fix everything underneath so that we don't look bad, but actually to, to claim um, that this is a part of our history and that, you know, the, the, we call it truth and reconciliation because you can't have a relationship without truth. And so starting from a point of truth so that way hopefully real relationship can continue to flourish is, uh, is a, an inspiration to me to continue to learn and, and what my place is in that. I appreciate you sharing that story as someone who is currently coming from the traditional and unceded lands of the Ohlone people. I think the three of us um, on this side are from that space. Um, but also because I think it models that a, a, a denomination can try for more than a decade and still not be there yet, right? But it was still the right thing to try for more than a decade and still not be there yet. And um, so thinking about that, there but not quite yet space. All of us who are on this conversation right now are professionals and as a, in our professional role we often answer questions that we might not want to but we do it anyway because we're professionals. Um, if you weren't a professional, are there questions you wish that people would stop asking you? Randy, you got any? Oh, I have lots. It is a public recorded forum, so choose what you I want know, to share. I know, but right? <laughs> there might be a couple of Lutherans who could stop asking you those questions, maybe. You know, I think one of the funniest questions, and I get this constantly, um, I am a more feminine lesbian, um, and my partner is more butch. Please don't ask who's the guy in the relationship, because I don't date men. I, I'm not married to one. I'm married to another female. 
Um, I think that's one of the longest questions that we've, I've gotten all the time. I still get it. Um, you know, I'm not asking you about your relationship and who's the guy type thing. And you're actually kind of asking what's going on in the bedroom, you know? Um, I think those questions, it's kind of like an ick factor. Um, I know for some of my friends, um, you know, them identifying with they, them pronouns or being a trans or non-binary person. And then you ask them, you know, what's going on in your pants? Let's talk about your genitals. Don't do that. That's never fun. If you don't want to answer it, you shouldn't be asking it. So I always think about like, if you wouldn't answer that question, don't ask it. At the same time, like, I, I'm always open as the professional to give those life lessons and let's talk about it. But when you're just out to dinner and you find out somebody's either queer or Jewish or this or that, ask for that consent. And if they say, no, I'm not comfortable with asking that, then respect that. Um, I think that that's like a couple of them. Um, as, an, as a professional, a lot of people always ask like, is your hair that purple? And I go, yeah, of course. You can totally ask about that. That's fine. Um, but those other little bit more personal things that you wouldn't ask yourself or answer yourself, um, just don't do it. <laughs> and, we're, and we're mostly talking about like, what are some language best practices? This is just a more fun way. Oh, for sure. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Sab Sab well, I, I actually, off the top of my head, can't really think about this, but then we don't have to be out there as, you know, in that professional capacity as much. But uh, I mean, there are uncomfortable questions about, uh, I mean, the usual, which I guess would be just stating the obvious things like fanaticism or, uh, and often the thing is, like I think uh, Randy said, it's, it's also a teachable moment. You can talk about, you know, why did you guys do X or, you know, the historical questions of, oh, but that was done a certain way. And, you know, why, why, does, why does Islam allow, you know, uh, killing non-Muslims and things like that. But again, it's, it's, you have to look at them as teachable moments and to point out and draw parallels. I, I love to draw parallels with other faiths and other communities. So that, you know, I think I'd leave it about there. Pam, you got any? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, um, anonymous question boxes are always very interesting when I have one of those at an event I do. So I like to do, like to do a little pre-read ahead of time. Um, sometimes they're fantastic and sometimes they're very interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that it's, it's really simple and, and it's less about, you know, stopping uh, asking it, but more just, you know, feeling uh, disheartened sometimes when I get a lot of questions like, you know, we're totally fine with, you know, queer people existing, you know, okay, thank you, you know. Um, but why do you have to like, just be so like, you know, queer about it, you know, like, so just like loud, you know, I'm, and they're like, I'm not going around saying I'm straight all the time. And so like, I don't understand. And you got this pride thing and you have, you know, interesting hair and you're wearing, you know, different clothes and just like, basically like, you know, it's fine, but like, could you just not let remind us of it, you know? And so it's this, it's a sort of weird space where, you know, it, it can seem like an innocent question, you know, but it does, it does make you feel and it does make, I think when folks get this, it's like that there's still something that we should be ashamed of, you know, that, that we can exist in a space, but we can more just be co-located, like we can be co-located next to each other. But, you know, we don't need to know about your quote unquote private life, whereas, you know, the person who's asking often their private life is is all over Facebook, all over their office desk, you know, that this is what they talk about. And so I think when it's sort of seen that us just living our lives is seen as, you know, political or controversial or rubbing it in somebody's face, you know, I think that that's just a reminder of, you know, how far we have to go. Um, in terms of um, just that our families and our lives are, are just that, you know, us talking about them isn't, isn't flaunting it. And by the way, um, if we did flaunt it, what's the problem? You know, we're cute, you know, <laughs> we, we're fun, right? So I think, I think that, you know, sometimes, um, 
I, I try to leave grace for people and I'd rather them ask me than the next person. Um, but I think it's just a reminder of, you know, that, that often, even when we're quote unquote accepted, we are expected to feel some shame about it. And we are expected to still, you know, fit in in a way that doesn't make other people uncomfortable. And I think that that is, you know, that's the frontier that, that is going to come where, um, you know, we're allowed, we're allowed to thrive and, and we can be in spaces and be just as proud of our challenges and our joys um, and, you know, be, be open about exactly what's happening in our lives without, without worrying that it's going to be interpreted in a way that, you know, we're completely non-normative. So um, I think that that eradication of shame is what I hope for of us just being able to flourish and be ourselves and be flawed too, that we don't have to be nice and polite in order to be accepted. Um, you know, and so, uh, yeah, I would say that's it. And then of course it's like, you know, how do, how do people have sex? How did it, you know, there's a lot of other questions and those ones I just say, you know, if you want to Google it, that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. I'll show you how to Google. It's fine. I also have um, some oh, advanced yeah. to that question. Let me, let me yeah. add. Just a few. I'm not going to explain because we're also running out of time. So two questions were asked of me. Well, the first question that was asked of me on my first visit to the U.S. in the late 90s. I was attending a, a conference. And the first question was like where I came from. Usual question. When I said I, I'm from the Philippines, uh, the person said, oh, you're Filipino. That's great. Which state are you from? I said, no, I'm from the Philippines, the Philippines. And the next question was where I learned how to speak English. I was like, really? <laughs> I'm tired of that question. Like always being asked, where are you from? Like, you know? Um, and then when I applied for political asylum, so I, I told, you know, I just became a US citizen last Monday, but I had to go through the, you know, I came as a grad student. I became a political asylum in 2007 because of, killings of activists in the Philippines. Um, two questions were asked by asylum officers during my interview. One was, you're a clergy person, because I came with my clergy collar on. Why are you doing all these protests and rabble rousing? So there's that disconnect from my faith and you know my social activism. So the only honest answer I could give was, well, it is the mandate of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, I, and that was it. <laughs> and then the second question was, if we grant you asylum, will you do all this rabble rousing in our country? Right? And I said, well, do you know the First Amendment? <laughs> and then she said, oh, yeah, of course, I know the First I was asking the, the asylum office. I said, she said, oh, the Bill of Rights. I mean, that's the cornerstone of our Constitution, our democracy. I said, well, if you grant me political asylum, I will use my First Amendment rights to rabble rouse in your country. And now that I am a citizen, I will also vote, right? And now being queer and also doing this job, and I'll end here, I always get the question, well, why are you still in your church? Because I'm United Methodist and we're still <laughs> struggling with this LGBTQ you know, affirmation and inclusion. Why are you still there? Like, I, I'm already getting tired of answering that question. But like what Saab said, these are teachable moments. And then another question is, which I always get because I, I live in a queer people of color house. A lot of people that I've lived with for the last 10 years are not people of faith, right? Um, and they, they always ask me, are you trying to convert queer people to religion? <laughs> and my answer is always this. We're already in it. I'm not, I'm not converting anybody. We're people of faith. There are people of faith in our churches, in our communities. So I'll end there with those questions. Amen. Yeah. And so thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's been really lovely to have you all. I feel like, I feel like the wisdom that you have shared is enough to make like a whole book on this subject and, and maybe we'll do that next, but, um, I, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, for those who have been watching our town halls, next Friday we'll have a whole gaggle of bishops who are sharing some of their ideas about what works um, and best practices they've seen in the Lutheran Church. So 
if you're interested in listening to that, uh, we'll be here. If not, pray for us because that's a lot of bishops in one Zoom call. <laughs> As um, I gaggle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Is I that was the thinking, co correct collective noun? I don't know. But you know, <laughs> pretty good though. It sounds, it sounds yeah. right. They're like geese sometimes. Um, so I think I normally remember in our pre-time to ask someone to pray at the end of this. But what I thought, because we have different interfaith voices, maybe um, each of us could say a sentence or two of blessing from our own space um, in words that are meaningful for us. And then together, all our words of blessings become even more blessed. Does that sound good? All right, mm -hmm. I'll start us off and then I trust you all to, to keep us going until we're done. Sound good? All right. Well, everyone, you are a blessing. And if anyone has lied to you and told you that it was not possible for you to be faithful, I am sorry. But you are able to be your full fabulous and God who has blessed Abraham is with you and for you. And I would add that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Whatever anyone says, whatever, inst whatever institution, government, persons, just know that nothing, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. Okay. I would I'm, say, I'll, oh, go ahead. Go for it. Go for it, Pam. Um, I would say that in our creed, it says uh, that we are not alone. God is with us. And that phrase, not alone, I hope that you take with you and know that um, the eternal one, the one who created you and all of your identity, who is the queerest of the queer, um, loves you and is with you on your journey through it all. You are not alone. I, I would start with the traditional greeting, which is simply "Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu," meaning "Peace be on you, the mercy of the Almighty, and the blessings of the Almighty." Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like to add that at, at moments like this, often people say, "I don't feel like celebrating this or that, especially uh, festival." And my point is, almost all our greetings are never about when we say Eid Mubarak or whatever, we're not talking about happiness, we're talking about blessings. And the tougher the situation it is, the, the harder we need to pray and the more we need our blessings. So that is, that is the message. I mean, the harder your path, and all our traditions say that, the harder the path, the closer God is to you. Always remember that. And I would just like to say that you have this beautiful divine spark that the universe, God, mm -hmm. goddess, anyone and everyone that created you is there and that you were creating the image of God. And that is the most divine thing that we can go into. And also Shabbat Shalom as we go into the weekend. And I hope that everyone has a, is, has a lovely weekend and is happy and healthy and safe, um, most importantly. Good job, Bye, everyone. Bye. Good job, Shalom. Shalom.